very much for coming along this evening. I hope that you learned something. Um, a little bit about me before we get going. Um, my name's Michaela. I'm a BANT registered nutritionist, uh, which basically means I'm regulated under the work that I do. And I need to be able to prove if asked um, that any of my recommendations, be it dietary or supplement or testing, uh, draw back into a scientific uh, base there. So I primarily work on a one-to-one -one setting uh, with people helping them to uh, improve upon their symptoms or work towards health goals, be it things like uh, uh, condition um, uh, management. So say if there's an uh, underactive thyroid issue, a hormone condition, menopause, PCOS, um, or other areas uh, such as weight loss, fertility, those kind of areas as well. I very um, specifically work um, uh, or particularly, sorry, work uh, with women uh, on female health. It's a very um, strong point of interest for me. I myself have PCOS, which, which is a hormone condition. I got into nutrition very reluctantly. I had absolutely no interest in it whatsoever, um, but I developed a chronic pain and fatigue condition many years ago called fibromyalgia. And after trying lots of different um, medications and therapies and nothing was really helping, I thought I would try and change my diet and see if that made a difference. And it made a huge difference. So fast forward now, um, I've been symptom-free for um, many years now, thankfully, and I now work with other people um, helping them manage their conditions as well from a dietary and supplement point of view as well. So sometimes within that, I do functional testing. We'll touch on that a little bit this evening in some areas. So things like cortisol testing, hormone, um, oat testing, uh, stool, those kind of things. So tonight we are talking about menopause. So an overview of this evening, we'll go over briefly uh, definitions around perimenopause and menopause. We'll also touch on some of the symptoms that we see often with perimenopause um, and uh, other body systems as well. Uh, and then we'll go through dietary changes, lifestyle changes, and areas to investigate. So the different stages of menopause. So we have perimenopause and the average age for that is 45 years old. Now, that being said, I feel, I know a lot of other practitioners also agree that the, a lot of the perimenopausal symptoms can be quite insidious and can actually start be uh, before the age of 45. And it can sometimes even be towards the late thirties and the early forties that we would start to see some of the, uh, I would say sneakier uh, perimenopause symptoms where perhaps it wouldn't necessarily associate them with uh, ourselves within hormonal change, but in fact, that's often where they can be coming from. So that sometimes can be the more mental health related symptoms uh, with feeling more up and down in the mood, um, lack of confidence, uh, feeling very anxious, difficulty sleeping. These can often start before you'd maybe be thinking that you might actually be perimenopausal. So we can start to see that um, earlier on. But uh, by definition is when you start to see the hormonal changes and you start to get the cycle fluctuations. So again, these can be quite subtle symptoms or it can be quite obvious where you start to get this um, the cycle shortening. Um, and, and sometimes it's missing a month or it's getting a longer month and then a shorter month. Um, or shorter cycle, sorry. So those can be some of the more obvious symptoms around perimenopause. And then menopause, the average age for that is 51. And that was the definition for menopause is the actual cessation or stopping of periods for 12 months or more. So that the actual menopause itself technically is only a one day occurrence because it's when you're looking back retrospectively and saying, I haven't had a period for 12 months. And that is technically when you have done menopause, which is kind of a weird thing to wrap your head around, but that is the technical definition of it. And then post-menopause is the stage 12 months onward when you've been without a period in that stage, you would be considered to be post-menopausal. So I'm going to go over some of the key body systems. Um, if you've been to talks of mine in the past, or if you have um, worked with me on a one-to-one -one setting, you'll be aware that I am very interested in medical history with people. So menopause is an outfit that looks different on every woman. So there are similarities across, of course, such as lowering uh, estrogen and testosterone and progesterone. However, there are many differences too. And it's about really understanding what makes you unique uh, within your health 
that may be things that are driving the symptoms that you can really work on. Um, and that's what we're going to get a little bit into this evening. So I like to give the example of an iceberg. So what we see with our health, be it with our um, sex hormones or in other areas of the health, um, what we see above the surface is only just the tip of the iceberg. And what we're seeing underneath is so much um, uh, broader and deeper than what we were seeing up top. So as an example of that within uh, menopause and perimenopause, we would have symptoms such as hot flashes, irregular cycles, uh, stress levels feeling uh, maybe unmanageable, lower energy, changes in digestion, feeling teary and emotional, reduced sex drive, insomnia. Uh, these are only some of the symptoms, it's actually many, many symptoms um, that don't always get pulled in. Um, these are just an example of some of them. And then under the surface, what we can see are many different areas that are actually all working together. And for some women, one area is going to be much more significant than others. So for example, uh, for, for someone who maybe has a history with the thyroid being underactive or subclinically underactive, that might be an area that needs particular attention. Whereas for others, maybe that's not an issue, but they've always had um, sensitivities around digestion. And now they're really noticing that symptoms feel um, new in that area and they're experiencing bloating or uh, difficulty digesting fats or feeling full really easily, those kind of symptoms. So um, it's about understanding where you're unique. Um, that is part of what I do when I'm working one-to-one -one with my clients is understanding um, what their health history is like and how that's sort of now coming up to the top in, um, in uh, tangent with everything else that's happening with the hormonal changes. So I'd like to give the example of a three-legged table or a three-legged stool when it comes to female health. So the stool itself, the top of the table is the overall female health. And then we have these three legs. So each leg represents a different part of our uh, hormone function and our um, in different areas of the body. So on one, we have the thyroid. On another leg, we have the sex hormones themselves. And then third leg, we have the adrenals. And I'm going to go through each of those in more detail in just a moment. But what we often see is that if one area, so say the thyroid is a little bit wobbly, the whole table feels a little bit wobbly, just as in a restaurant, if you're eating something and the table feels a little bit off there. So that's really something to consider with our health, because you think if maybe you've had um, a lot of stress going on for quite a while, but you've been kind of getting away with it, and then starting to go through perimenopause or menopause, and then you're noticing these changes in the sex hormones, then the table's getting more and more wobbly and might just you know, tip over. And then we can sort of feel like that where we feel like we've reached a breaking point within our health. So we'll start with the sex hormones specifically. And this is an overview of a simplified version of a cycle. So each of these different colors represents a different hormone. And um, when you, I would say, you know, when you look at this, you think, crikey, this is a lot going on here. And that's how we can feel that way, is that there's a lot going on with us, with our hormones, because the hormones are tied in with our energy and our nervous system function um, through the relationship they have with the thyroid and with the adrenals. And um, so we can really feel that we're going up and down as the hormones are going up and down. Uh, just in general. And then of course you layer on top of that when you're then having perimenopausal changes or menopause, and then things can be even um, feel even more um, in flux. So the, we have four stages within the cycle. The first stage is menstruation. As you can see, pretty much all the uh, hormones represented here are quite low and um, that's normal and to be expected. And then you move into the follicular phase which is the time of leading up to ovulation. And we start to get an increase here of um, estradiol, uh, which is one of the estrogen metabolites. During that time, if you have paid attention to that sort of thing, or if you think back to, if you've tried to conceive, this is when we would normally see a change in cervical mucus. So we get the egg white cervical mucus, and that largely comes from the surge of estrogen during that time. Then the luteinizing hormone catches up, and that then increases um, to a point where these sort of, as you can see, you've got three of those hormones all at a peak together, and then ovulation would typically occur, and then they have a big drop. At that point, then the progesterone, which is the blue line here, is what then takes over into the luteal phase. So the reason I'm talking about this now, even though we're discussing perimenopause, is because what can happen, and um, what typically does happen during perimenopause, is that you have a, a changing within the cycle. Now, the thing to be aware of 
is that it's not the um, the second part of the cycle, the luteal phase that changes, but it is the follicular phase that changes and the ovulate, the first sort of half of the cycle that is um, changing. So you think typically, this is based on a day 28 cycle, that ovulation is occurring around um, day 14. And what we would normally see for the average woman, a luteal phase is 12 to 14 days later. So if you're someone who maybe has always had a period on uh, on day 28 of their cycle, you've typically been ovulating at this point. Now, what often happens in perimenopause is that the cycle becomes shorter. So you're having more frequent periods. And this is due to partly the follicle stimulating hormones starting to increase. And so you're ovulating a little bit sooner in your cycle. So instead of ovulating on day, um, say on day 14, maybe ovulating on day 10, or day 12. And then that way we can see, because remembering that the luteal phase doesn't change, it's the earlier part of the cycle that changes. So then the period's coming a little bit sooner um, around day maybe 25 or 26 or 27. Um, and this is significant for a few reasons. Uh, one being around the, um, the change in your fertile period. It's not that uncommon um, that, that I work with women who got unexpectedly pregnant during perimenopause because they sort of thought they were in a safe zone and they didn't think they would be you know, ovulating so early on. Um, but the other thing to consider is, again, going back to how much these hormones are going up and down. And we'll soon learn in, in a few slides the relationship that some of these hormones have with things like serotonin and GABA. And so if they're moving up and down more frequently when these shorter cycles, and we can really feel like we're moving up and down in our, in our mental health um, more frequently as well. So for example, in progesterone here, um, your progesterone is a really important um, uh, hormone for your sex hormone function, but it also, again, has more of a far reaching effect than just the sex hormones themselves. So it's actually um, a metabolic intermediate in the production of other hormones. So what that means is that your progesterone is involved in more than just itself. It is also um, linked with the production in other areas. So um, one of the big ones that progesterone is used for is around brain development and protection. So it's actually got a neuroprotective element to it, which is really important when we're thinking about our brain health. And I think that brain health isn't something that gets covered enough in general about menopause and uh, perimenopause, but is really something to think about. And a lot of that comes from the progesterone. It's also involved in helping you create something called GABA. Now GABA is a calming neurochemical or neurohormone is one way to think about it. If you've heard of cortisol before, which is your stress hormone, GABA is sort of like the opposite of that. And if we think back to this chart here, where we see on that blue line that already at the beginning of the cycle, progesterone is quite low. And then we get a nice increase of it after ovulation, but then it's doing really st quite steep drop before a period starts. Um, and thinking that that progesterone is really tied up in helping you create GABA and dopamine. So if you're menopausal and you're not having periods, or if you're, um, your cycle is becoming shorter, then you'll be spending potentially less time with this nice progesterone, which means you could be spending less time enjoying GABA, if that makes sense. So we will go through certain foods that you can eat that support GABA production, um, but that's a really big thing, a big takeaway of how we can get the increased insomnia because GABA helps you with, your, with staying asleep, uh, increased anxiety, increased panic attacks, uh, feeling overwhelmed and stressed, even if it's the same amount of stress that you've always had. Um, a lot of that can be coming from the changes in progesterone production specifically. So the next hormone we're going to go through is estrogen. Now we say estrogen, but actually estrogen refers to lots of different estrogen metabolites, but uh, for simplification, we'll just say estrogen. Um, it's involved again, of course, with the maintenance of your reproduction system, uh, but also around your heart health. So it protects against buildup of plaque, thinking about your bone health as well um, around the density. So um, with the bones, again, it's kind of a funny thing to think about, but we technically have about seven different skeletons in our entire lives, because even our bones themselves are breaking down and rebuilding. And part of what helps them with the rebuilding process is estrogen. So if you are in the postmenopausal um, range, really want to think about what you can do to support your bone health. Uh, we'll go through certain foods to eat there, but to help with the new 
bone cell stimulation um, specifically is impact sports. So things like running and walking or jogging are all things that help with the um, with that bone response, uh, bone building response and those particular cells that help the body do that. But estrogen is also involved in serotonin production. So again, if we're going back and we're thinking around the ovulation period, it's not that uncommon for women to feel quite energized at that point, feel quite good, and then can often feel a bit of a drop um, when they're then post ovulatory cycle uh, stage of their cycle. And again, if we're thinking about if you are in a stage where you're not having periods or you're postmenopausal and the estrogen is lying quite low, then that can contribute into the lower feelings that we can sometimes see with hormonal changes around um, depression or just feeling quite teary and quite emotional or maybe having a more emotive response to things than you would have done in the past. So in the nicest way possible, um, I like to say it's not you, it's your hormones. And a lot of what we experience actually does come down to what's happening with our hormones. But again, there are things we can do to support our bodies um, through this time and with our hormones in general. So this is a quick glimpse into one section within functional medicine, uh, sort of hormone testing that I do. Um, this would be appropriate for women who think they are maybe perimenopausal. Um, it's a urine test, which is done uh, at first thing in the morning, every day almost of an entire cycle. So it's quite helpful because it's not just a snapshot on one day, but it's actually tracking across the entire cycle, what's happening with the estrogen um, metabolites and what's happening with the progesterone as well. So as I said, um, you can see that sometimes um, in say a perimenopausal woman, um, which is not the case here, that they, um, ovulation might be occurring earlier on. So their, their estrogen might be spiking sort of up here and then having a shorter cycle. But it can be quite useful to have a look at this kind of testing, uh, which I do in my clinics very often because it also looks at the estrogen metabolites, how well um, or sort of what uh, liver pathways the body is favoring when it comes to clearing through those hormones. This is significant uh, because there are different um, uh, estrogens here associated uh, with different symptoms. So we tend to prefer women to use this, this pathway, which is protective to make something called 2-OH as opposed to making 4-OH and 16-OH, which are the ones that are associated a little bit more with oxidative stress and binding and damaging to um, DNA. That's just a quick glimpse into hormone um, there. But the thing to take away from this is that within estrogen, you know, quite often if you're speaking with a GP or trying to look into this yourself, you will think about estrogen as a singular, um, and often it's this marker here, estradiol, which is tested, when actually there are so many estrogen metabolites with all different, I like to say different personalities, um, that can be um, perhaps an, in uh, different ratios at different points during your life. So the next little leg to think about is the thyroid. So your thyroid is a butterfly-shaped gland in your uh, sort of a located in the middle of your throat. Um, it's got many different functions, very much involved in your metabolism, uh, your energy production, uh, your weight. We can even see it impacting things like skin and hair and digestion. So um, with the thyroid uh, in my clinics, if I'm women are telling me they're finding it really difficult to lose weight and they're, they're trying everything, but it's not working with their energy, they're feeling very fatigued and it's not, um, uh, they're not feeling well rested when they wake up. Um, or if they're feeling quite cold, quite often, I'm often thinking about the thyroid. So the reference ranges with the thyroid um, are really quite broad. Um, and it's not that uncommon for someone to be what would be considered subclinical. So it's not at a point where you'd be needing to get medication, which is, of course, a good thing. But it certainly could be at a point where if we're thinking about back to that three legged table, where even if it's just a little bit underactive, um, but you also have the other legs that are a little bit wobbly, then that can become more significant during this time in your life. So that would be something under the iceberg or under the surface that would be more significant for you or for you and I to work on. So where we see the thyroid and the hormones relating um, is that we can think about postnatal changes so that you may have experienced this or know someone who's experienced this, but it's not that uncommon after um, giving birth for a woman to have an overactive or underactive thyroid. Um, and we can also see a link between two uh, uh, autoimmune conditions 
uh, one called Hashimoto's, which is an underactive thyroid driven from autoimmune and endometriosis. And we can see that link very often between those two conditions. So with the adrenals, which is the other leg that we have not covered just yet, um, but that's to do with stress, uh, there's a very interesting link that we can see between the way that your thyroid functions and how it is influenced by stress. Um, so you have um, this thyroid hormone called TSH, and TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. So this is the sort of first domino in the hormone, uh, thyroid hormone function um, sort of uh, chain of events. And when you have high levels of cortisol, it actually starts to inhibit your TSH levels. So you may be, perhaps the thyroid is trying to function, but because you have a lot of this, you know, chronic stress or high levels of cortisol pumping around, then we can start to have the thyroid function being a little bit suppressed. The other area that it can impact um, within the thyroid is a hormone called T3, which um, when you have a lot of uh, cortisol circulating, we can start to make something called reverse T3, which is essentially reverse thyroid. So you may be making enough thyroid hormone, but if you have lots of this cortisol going, then your body's sort of almost giving with one hand and taking from another hand. So it's important if you do suspect your thyroid um, to not jump the gun and start taking lots of supplements and, and uh, making lots of big dietary changes without fully understanding what's going on. So I do thyroid testing myself, blood testing in clinics with women um, very often. And I will always um, look for antibody activity um, if I'm suspicious of the thyroid. The reason for that being um, typically on the NHS, you will get your TSH and your T4 tested. So this is thyroid stimulating hormone and your thyroxine. However, the other three markers are often not looked at. Um, they're more expensive to do for the NHS, so they typically will not do them as a first line. Um, but it's important to understand them because T4 um, is your thyroid hormone, but T3 is a more active form of the um, thyroid hormone. And if we do see that there's dysfunction there, it's really important to understand where that is coming from um, before you start making big changes with supplements and with dietary things. Um, the reason for that being there's something that is in almost all thyroid complexes called iodine. Um, and we also get a lot of these uh, green powders that have things like spirulina, which if there is an uh, autoimmune component to the thyroid being a little bit underactive or overactive, then they can actually um, add fuel to the fire, so to speak. So it's really important to be safe with your thyroid and to test and not guess if you are suspicious of it there. So again, I have specific ranges that I like to see women at with the thyroid that are more um, picky, a little bit more fussy um, than what we might see on a typical NHS reference range. And then the last area to think about are the adrenals. So your adrenals are these little um, glands that sit on top of your kidneys, like little cats, and they're involved in your um, DHEA and your cortisol production. And uh, the big job that they have um, after menopause is that they actually start to get involved um, even more so in your estrogen production for you. So that's something new for them, or it's a job that they're doing in a bigger way than they've done um, at any other point in your life. So it's really important to take care of the adrenals because we're thinking that that's what's involved in your stress response. And as I covered earlier, we already have with GABA being uh, lower from progesterone being lower and potentially serotonin also being impacted by lower levels of estrogen. So it's all the more reason to really think about taking care of your adrenal health. So we have something, you may have come across it before, called the HPA axis. And what that means, uh, it stands for the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And as you can see on this image here, this is actually taken from a hormone test that looks at cortisol. Um, the HPA stands for hypothalamus pituitary adrenal gland. So basically what it's saying here, what this is illustrating is the way that our bodies respond to stress. So you have external stress coming in. So maybe work or home life or everything um, coming in. Um, but we can have internal sources of stress. So that can be from an inflammatory condition or pro-inflammatory cytokines in the body. Um, and then that then kicks off a stress response. So that puts us into the fight or flight or the sympathetic nervous state. And that's where we start pumping out cortisol. So this is a really important thing to take note of 
um, at this point in your life, when you're thinking about your hormones changing around, um, that we really want to take care of our adrenal function. And again, we'll cover that later on. This is a sample from a cortisol test that I've done with someone, which is from saliva. So it's done at a waking point, half an hour, 60 minutes, afternoon and night. And um, we can actually see with this person that they have a depressed um, response. So their cortisol should be shooting up in the morning. It's actually going down. Um, so they'll be feeling very tired um, at this point. And they're in the very lowest point of the reference range and then actually below reference range over here. So with cortisol, naturally, we wake up and we get a little boost of it. And then half an hour later, we should have about 50 to 150 percent increase is normally what we see. Uh, and this is when you, if you've had a chance to, where you're waking up and you're sort of dozing in bed and then, you know, half an hour or so goes by and you think, okay, I can get up. And this is part of that is from that cortisol increasing there. Um, but one thing that we'll cover later on is about caffeine and how that can really impact this morning part of your day um, and uh, what to do about that. There are other body systems which are significant during uh, any sort of hormonal change. So the gallbladder, it's, uh, you may be experiencing this or know someone who has, but it's not that uncommon around menopausal changes that we start to have difficulty with digesting fats. Um, we can also see changes around digestion. Um, again, you know, acid reflux can be a symptom that comes very often, um, constipation or diarrhea, just changes within your di normal digestion for you. The liver and kidneys are very important. They are your detox hormone hormones, and they all are involved in processing through your hormones once they've been used up. And then the other thing is histamine. So um, I thought I would include this this evening because it doesn't really get mentioned that often, but it actually is something to consider when it comes to um, menopause. And it's very common that women uh, may, can, may have experienced this even um, postnatally as well with hormonal changes um, are more reactive with their histamine. So histamine is a part of your immune system and it's involved with your mast cells. Um, and it is, you think about hay fever, where you're taking antihistamines to sort of control that histamine response. And there's actually a relationship between histamine and your hormones because estrogen actually um, interacts with the mast cells that release your histamine. And even if you're thinking, well, if I'm menopausal, then surely I have low levels of estrogen. But if the estrogen and progesterone ratio is off and there's maybe a little bit higher estrogen than progesterone, then that can still impact in that histamine uh, reaction. So that's something to consider. I will go through histamine foods a little bit later on um, and what to sort of do if you suspect that you are a little bit more reactive to histamine at the, or with your histamine at the moment. Uh, but typical symptoms, we get a lot of sort of puffiness in the face, itchy skin, uh, feeling a little bit more mucousy. These are all quite typical histamine uh, reactions. So what can we do about it? <laughs> the good news. So the good news is there's lots that we can do to support our hormones. Um, if you've worked with me before, I'll often say, you know, if there's lots going on, one way to think about it is good, there's lots going on. So there's lots that we can do. And I like to give the example with gardening. So you might put down lots of different types of seeds and some things you would see um, the little seedling coming up really soon. And other things you might be thinking, gosh, this is taking a long time. Is there even anything happening under there? And then all of a sudden you see a little seedling. So that can be the case with our body. Some of our systems are on uh, slower, uh, slower to react than others. Um, but there, there is work that we can do. So in general, I'd like to recommend a sort of diet, which is based in across the Mediterranean model. Um, so very rich in anti-inflammatory foods, omega-3 foods. We're thinking uh, very much around lots of nice beans, uh, lots of fresh uh, vegetables, excuse me, and a base around lean protein. So eggs, chicken, turkey, and beans. Um, but turkey in particular is very helpful if you are someone who is feeling a little bit lower in their mood because turkey has something in it called tryptophan, which is at the very bottom of the serotonin uh, production line. Something to consider there. Um, brassicas are also something to consider trying to get in maybe a portion per day. Uh, brassica family includes uh, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, they're all involved in um, the hormone clearance um, and hormone metabolism uh, side of things. So if we think back to that um, 
there's three different little pathways that the body uses to make either protective, to make that nice protective estrogen. Um, the brassicas help have something in it called DIM, which helps the body go more a little bit down that protective pathway. Also thinking about omega-3s. So omega-3s are very time and time again get spoken about, um, but they have um, unsaturated fatty acids, really helpful for things like your heart health as well, which remembering is something to really consider at this time, also helpful for the joints. So omega-3s would be thinking oily fish, so salmon, uh, sardines, anchovies, um, all of extra virgin olive oil, walnuts, um, and avocados. Blood sugar balance is a really big one as well, which we'll go through in a little bit more detail, but that can be very significant, um, can impact into the way that we hold weight uh, into our and, and also into our cortisol levels as well, which we know has then further reaching um, impacts into how we feel. And phytoestrogens. So phytoestrogens um, seem to, which essentially they're uh, plant, plant estrogens. Um, so there will be things that we get in um, soy products, flax seeds, um, our two rich sources of phytoestrogens. And they seem to mimic estrogen um, in our bodies. Um, and the research is not super consistent on it, but it does seem to mimic estrogen in our body. Um, and it uh, can be quite helpful things to, um, to bring in to the mix. The easiest way to know is to try eating more phytoestrogens and see if you notice it, an impact um, in, your, um, in your health. Um, with phytoestrogens, we want to think about flax seeds um, and making them freshly ground ourselves, which sounds complicated, but it needn't be. You would just be putting um, a tablespoon or, or two into a blender when you're making a smoothie from whole, and that would get them freshly ground up and you have a richer source of omega-3 and phytoestrogens from them at that point. Calcium is really important. So the rough recommendation for women um, under 50 of calcium per day is 700 milligrams. However, over 50, it almost doubles up to 1200 milligrams. So with calcium, we want to be thinking about um, small fish, you know, small tin fish like sardines, anchovies, we'll be getting those little bones, um, uh, tahini, sesame paste um, is a good source and dairy if you tolerate it well. Foods to limit, unfortunately. Um, so gluten, alcohol, and sugar are the three biggest ones I'd normally think about when we're thinking about hormones. Um, my approach, as I said, I only got into nutrition very reluctantly myself. Um, and I have a very balanced, uh, or hopefully feels balanced approach to nutrition. And really what we're thinking about is what we're doing most of the time. What our body is concerned about is what's happening 90% of the time, 80%. If you're having a little bit of alcohol here and there, you're eating some sugar here and there, it's not going to be the end of the day. If that means that everything else is going to feel more sustainable for you in the long term, that's what's important. We don't want you to be on a diet because diets have to end. And normally what happens when they end is we then end up binging and then we're back to square one or maybe even before square one. So just thinking, be mindful about these things. Um, alcohol um, can contribute into inflammation. Many people can have a pro-inflammatory response to gluten as well. Um, and sugar also is uh, sort of pro-inflammatory too. So the, a lot of the inf inflammatory uh, related symptoms around hormonal change can be um, increased or at least contributed to by these um, gluten, alcohol, and sugar. So I did promise I would speak about histamine. So with histamine, if you imagine that you have an empty cup, and this is your, this is your uh, histamine cup. And so what should happen is as the day goes on, maybe you breathe in some pollen or maybe you eat something you have a low grade allergy to. Uh, maybe you eat something that's high in histamine and those histamine levels build up and then we get an overspill. And if we think about hay fever, you can sort of visualize that where you see people who are having a histamine reaction and they're having that overspill almost of mucus uh, when they're having you know, streaming eyes and streaming nose. But as I said, you can have histamine reactions that have nothing to do with um, sort of more of a mucus response, but can be getting that itchy skin or a little bit of puffiness. Um, and hormonally, if things are changing there, then we can be a little bit more prone or possibly a little bit more prone to releasing histamine um, during that time. So there are certain foods which are high in histamine. So ready meals, tomatoes, chocolate, and red wine, caffeine, so coffee and tea are also high in histamine. Um, but within that, I don't want you to get too hooked into this because a lot of the um, advice, if you look at histamine from a dietary point of view is doing low histamine diets or antihistamine diets, and they're so incredibly restrictive. It's not something that would be 
sustainable in the long term. So within that, if you think back to that sort of iceberg um, idea, is thinking a little bit deeper. So why are you reacting so strongly to histamine foods? Yes, or maybe it's hormonal things, but are there nutrient deficiencies where you're not breaking, making uh, the enzyme enough to break down your histamine to sort of keep up with the demand? Do you have low grade food allergies? So you're having a little histamine reaction there. Again, I, I also do allergy testing. Um, or is there a gut microbiome off, which could be contributing to your histamine as well? So other things that you can kind of do around that, um, but it is something worth um, just considering there. With the thyroid, there are specific food, um, are specific nutrients that your thyroid loves. Selenium um, is one of them. Two Brazil nuts per day um, is around about the amount of selenium that your thyroid would love to have every day. Um, iodine rich foods, so ionized salts, seaweed and seaweed flakes and eggs are all lovely sources um, for the thyroid. And then adrenals. So if you've been to any of my talks before, I always find a way to wiggle this in is about having caffeine on an empty stomach. Please, if the only thing you do from today is stop doing this, I will be very happy. Um, but when you have caffeine on an empty stomach, as we saw, your cortisol is already at, quite, at its highest point about half an hour after you wake up, which is normally most people have coffee. And then if you're having caffeine, it's the first thing that's coming in, your cortisol is going to spike up even higher, which is then going to contribute to things like uh, hormonal symptoms, heart palpitations, anxiety, um, and then an energy crash later on. So um, it's not no coffee. It's just about having some of your breakfast first before you then have your coffee. And again, we're seeing alcohol and sugar coming through there as well. So blood sugar balance. Now, if you don't get too fixated on all the text here, the thing to focus on is this black bar in the middle. So this represents roughly one teaspoon of sugar, which is all the sugar that we need from head to toe at any given time. Maybe we don't feel like that. I know I don't always feel like I only need that much sugar, but our bodies feel like we only need that much. So when you have something that's going to put you up high, so it may be that you've had very carbohydrate rich meal, or you've had some sugar on its own, um, or um, uh, then, what, then what will happen is your blood sugar is then spiking. Ultimately, you end up storing this or more likely to store this in the fat cells, which is how we can gain weight from um, eating higher sugar foods. Uh, because when you're high like this, your body feels like it's an emergency. We'll try and do what it can to bring your blood sugar back down. And part of that will be putting that excess sugar into the fat cells to sort of remove them out of the bloodstream. So then what happens, you end up with a drop. Um, and then we actually can end up um, burning our muscle and holding onto the fat storages and we can end up having an energy crash at that point. So this is why quite often with women, I'm not that keen on doing things like intermittent fasting um, and, you know, skipping meal or exercising on an empty stomach. I prefer women to have this more sort of stable blood sugar by eating uh, foods which um, have a fat and a protein. So if you were to be having something, say if you were having a cupcake, again, you don't have to never eat sugar again, but if you were having that, if you were to have protein or a fat at the same time, um, then your blood sugar will not have such an increase, such a big spike at that time. So thinking about making sure you have a protein or if you've had some uh, vegetables beforehand, um, it will inhibit how much glucose your body can um, take in from the more sugary food that you're eating. Uh, the other thing to think about using lemon, uh, fresh lemon and vinegars um, as dressings uh, also increase um, the sensitivity to insulin. So we spend a little bit less time up here. Um, so that's something else that you can think about doing. So with everything we've spoken about from a dietary point of view, just as we said with the iceberg, not every single thing is going to be um, the most important for you. It's not possible. So you'll have a few things which are going to be more relevant. So you may have gone through a really stressful time in the past few years, um, but your thyroid has been um, pretty much unaffected and you've got really strong, healthy thyroid. But someone else may have the opposite and maybe they've not been through too much with their stress but maybe they have a un subclinical underactive thyroid and that needs to be a route that they go down. So it's really important to understand where you're unique within this. Um, a few lifestyle influencers. So again, if you are thinking about cortisol, the type of exercise you do is something to consider. So really stop exercising on an empty stomach, eating something beforehand, eating something little afterwards as well is going to be very helpful with the cortisol response there. Thinking about your sleep hygiene and your stress management it's not much we can do about the stress that we have, um, but how we respond to it can be helpful with um, 
with our overall hormonal health. Um, and we also want to think about further investigations, just building on this idea about you being unique and you having your own individual um, uh, sort of understanding of your own hormones. So if you're not able to work with someone like myself who would sort of do this for you or help you learn how to do this for yourself, um, a starting point is to start gathering information for yourself and learning your own statistics, knowing your numbers about yourself. So unfortunately, a lot of female um, health conditions are a little bit underserved, a little bit not um, very well understood. So you do have to do a lot of research yourself, a lot of advocating for yourself. But as a starting point, getting your GP to look at your thyroid, looking at your B12, looking at your iron, your storage for iron is ferritin on the NHS, the reference range varies from county to county, but is roughly 15 to 200, which is a huge reference range. So you could be within the lower end of normal and being told that you're completely normal where in actual fact, remembering that you're not just that one thing, you have many different things going on. And so that thyroid being a little bit slow or the iron being a little, just a touch on the lower side can actually feel quite significant to your body. So starting there. Um, another thing to think about um, is around functional testing. Um, so thinking about hormonal testing, adrenals, uh, so your cortisol response. Um, allergies are quite a significant one. Um, if you are feeling as though you're a little bit histamine-y, um, particularly this time of the year as well, if we're already having a little bit more uh, for our immune systems to handle a very high pollen at the moment, um, the allergy hormone link can feel quite strong. But you can influence your hormones. I hope that you feel that there's a few things you can try from what we've spoken about this evening, but the individual differences really count and find out what makes you unique. If you can't sort of work along with myself, trying to figure that out for yourself and, and think having a think about, you know, what things that I've spoken about this evening and what maybe resonated with you. Um, as I said, I have upcoming, upcoming talks coming up um, on adult ADHD and mental health uh, over the next few months. Um, I have allergy testing offer at the moment, which is a blood test um, and includes a 20 minute consultation with myself. Um, the lab that I do this particular test with has discounted it for me, so I'm able to pass that along. Um, and as I said, I do free 15 minute initial consultations. So if you would like to get in touch to arrange that with myself, I'm more than happy to have a chat with you about your unique health and um, what we might be able to do to support in that area. And um, I do meal planning, uh, testing, supplement recommendations, that kind of thing. So I'm going to stop sharing and answer some questions. Um, thank you very much for coming along this evening. I really hope that you've learned something and that you've enjoyed the talk and you feel a little bit more empowered about your hormones and a little bit less at their mercy. Um, so let me just have a look here at the questions and I'll answer um, what I can through here. Um, okay, so we've got on here um, the... Um, sorry. Um, okay. So high levels of stress, um, precipitate menopause. Yes. Um, so that was a little bit earlier on in the talk. So hopefully I covered that. Um, but we can see there's such a strong relationship between your hormones and your, uh, stress, um, your stress hormones. So sometimes if we're seeing an increase in one that in cortisol, for example, um, we're spending more time in what's called the sympathetic nervous state sometimes gets called fight or flight. Um, which is, um, if you think about if you're in fight or flight, um, your body's thinking you're in physical danger at that point. So some things start to go on the back burner as far as priorities. And that would be things like digestion, your immune function, and your sex hormone function. So, you know, we experience this ourselves when we're very stressed. We can often feel, you know, an upset stomach or butterflies in the stomach. Um, and uh, as far as the hormones go, you think back and maybe you had a late cycle and maybe you ovulated late that month because of the stress. Um, so they're so closely related. And I, I do see that when we start to get into menopausal um, sort of times of life, that those, that, that kind of experience only seems more um, exaggerated. So definitely can be um, related during that time. Um, someone has put um, on here about asking about the thyroid testing process. Um, so with the thyroid testing that I do, it is a blood test um, that you do on your um, on your finger and you I would um, set it up for you, goes off to the lab um, and then a doctor would review it and I review it as well. And then we go through results together. So you can contact me individually about setting that up if it's something that you would be interested in. Um, 
Someone's put on here about um, is drinking a glass of water before a coffee a little better than an empty stomach. So to our bodies, breakfast is, um, is called breakfast because it's breaking a fast. So even if you've not been fasting for very long, just maybe 10 hours or when you went to sleep, to our bodies, it is a fast. So if you had water, that wouldn't be considered breaking the fast. It would be actual food that breaks it. And so um, if you're thinking about food, um, it is a bit confusing, but that would consider things like coffees and teas and milks to be in the food category. So if water's coming in first and then you're having coffee, it would still have the same impact on your cortisol. So you would need to get some of that, um, some of that food into your system before you start having, um, uh, before you start having um, your coffee. Um, how much flaxseed should you have in a day? I normally would recommend two uh, tablespoons per day. Um, it is actually a nice one that it is um, cheaper to buy whole flax seeds than it is to buy the big bag of the ground up flax seeds. And actually the ground flax seeds are the ones that don't have as much of that phytoestrogen to them. So just get the cheap whole, ground, whole flax seeds. I think it's a pound, this, pound for a bag this big from Tesco. And you can just put them straight into, um, into your blender and that will um, get them nice and fresh for you. Um, someone on here is saying, very interesting, I have B12 deficiency and autoimmune thyroid, explains why I'm constantly tired. So again, um, that's right. So B12 is only one B vitamin of many, and um, it's not standard at all in the NHS to test other B vitamins. Um, but some of those can be, if, if you have deficiency in one, it's not that uncommon to have deficiencies in the others. Um, and some of those, for example, B6 is involved in dopamine production which then helps with your um, uh, sort of motivation and energy levels as well. Um, so something to consider with that there. Um, just another question on the flax seeds. Yes, you do need to ground, ground them up fresh. Um, if you don't want to do that every day, which is completely understandable, what you can do if you have a blender, buy the packet of whole flax seeds, golden or brown, doesn't matter. Put them in the blender, blend them up so that they look like a little flower almost. Um, and then just put them in a Ziploc bag and keep them in your freezer and then take them out as you need when you're adding them to yogurt and salads and soups um, each day. So again, thinking about two tablespoons there. Um, just checking some other questions here. Um, is there a better time in your cycle to ask for these tests from a GP? As my test came back clear a few years ago and I keep getting told I'm too young for perimenopause, but I have so many symptoms. So as I was saying, I'm not sure if you caught the beginning of the talk, that perimenopause on average starts at 45, but actually it's not that uncommon in the late 30s and early 40s to start seeing those symptoms. Um, I would normally recommend in this sort of instance, um, get in touch maybe for us to do the Dutch test, which is the, um, the hormone testing across the whole month. So we're looking um, at every day of a cycle to really see what's going on with your estrogen. Um, but it does depend to each specific hormone that you're looking at. Some should be tested at the beginning of a cycle and some um, on day 21. So it does kind of depend specifically on which sex hormone, but in general with the thyroid and B12 and iron can be at any time during your cycle. Um, and is tea any better than coffee? Is it still caffeine? Unfortunately, yes, it is still caffeine. Um, so get some of that uh, food in there first. Um, someone here saying the fluctuations of cycle is only to be shorter. Can it also be longer and heavier? Yes, definitely. We can see that where the cycle is becoming longer um, there. And then when it does come, it's, it's very heavy. Um, so we definitely can see that as well. Um, it's, it's just short. It happens what I see the most, but definitely the heavier, um, longer cycles is something that I can see as well. And someone's put on here, does the response to tomatoes histamine differ with fresh or canned? Um, Yes, in general, canned foods um, are higher in histamine. It doesn't mean to never have a tinned tomato ever again in your life. Again, if we're thinking about histamine, if that's something that has resonated with you, we want to be thinking kind of multiple layers. So if you're quite histamine you know, reactive up here, where is that coming from? Underneath, you're releasing a lot of histamine. What's driving that? Are there low-grade food allergies? Um, are there deficiencies of things like zinc? Um, that help your body create this enzyme called diosin that break down your histamine for you is the gut microbiome off um, so that when you're waking up if you're thinking about that histamine cup are you waking up and your histamine cup's already halfway full so you don't have much tolerance there so i wouldn't get too fixated on the antihistamine diet idea because it's so incredibly restrictive and it's really not a sustainable dietary model um, but again thinking about 
you know, really getting underneath, you know, under the root of what's going on with that histamine response that you're experiencing. And, you know, hormone can be part of that, but, um, you know, um, uh, thinking, I'm sorry, I got distracted by the chat, um, but thinking about where that could be coming from that you can do something about here. Um, okay, so I'm going to see if I can answer a few others. So someone here said, I have a coil. I have no idea of my cycle. How can I check where I'm at? I have many symptoms. So within the coil, I often actually work with women um, still on their hormones, even if they're taking HRT, the pill or a coil, there's still a lot that can be done. Um, and um, it would be a little bit individual depending on which type of contraceptive that they're on or type of hormone replacement therapy that they're taking. Um, but then in those cases, we might be thinking a little bit more about the other two legs, you know, the thyroid and the adrenals and general hormone support, more of a focus on the hormone clearance. So things like excuse me, thinking about the brassicas, thinking about the, the liver and the kidney support there um, uh, in, in those cases. Um, so someone saying, if I'm avoiding dairy, how can I be sure I'm getting enough calcium? So you can think about high quality calcium supplement, um, but from a dietary point of view, um, the little tin fish that you get sardines and anchovies, because you actually get really little access to those little tiny bones, um, are a really nice source of calcium. Also tahini that you can use in salad dressings as well. And you know, sesame paste um, also are a nice source of calcium too. Um, so, um, and just lastly, I'll answer one more question here. Um, someone is saying, what does the adrenal test involve? So the adrenal test is a cortisol test, um, which is uh, saliva. So you take your sample at multiple, you know, the, on the point where you could see it was waking and then it was um, half an hour later, an hour later, afternoon and evening. So you do a sample at those multiple points and they get sent off um, and then they'll get analyzed and they come back to me and then I'll go through them um, in an appointment with you. Um, so what we would see, for example, if we saw that, um, you know, adrenal, uh, the cortisol levels are really high at certain points, we would start trying to make supplement changes and dietary changes to address where we're seeing things are a little bit off at those, at those points, um, try and bring in some support there. Um, okay, I know I said no more questions, but I'll do one more. <laughs> um, so there is one question on here about metallic taste and or body odor related to the thyroid. Now with the body odor, um, actually sometimes I can see that when um, there's maybe, um, you know, with the liver needing a little bit of support, if the hormones are not sort of maybe clearing through very well, um, we sometimes, um, can see with people who have constipation that that can be the case um because with our bodies you so you produce your estrogen and then it goes through your liver and then your body sends the estrogen down to the um, stool and in a bowel movement you'll physically remove that estrogen now if you're someone who's constipated and you're not having regular bowel movements so for me i would consider a regular bowel movement uh, one or two per day so if you're having a bowel movement maybe only a few times per week then that estrogen, what happens is it gets called uncoupled, where the body will take that estrogen back out and then it has to go through the liver again. And then it, if it doesn't go again, then it has to go again. Meanwhile, you're making more estrogen on the side. Um, and it's like when you forget to do a load of washing and then you see it in the laundry and in, in the washing machine, you think, oh, I have to put it through again. So you're washing that same laundry over and over again. Meanwhile, you have more laundry piling up on the side. And we can start to see some of those symptoms coming. Um, the symptoms we can see that sometimes can be around the more estrogen dominant uh, symptoms, but we can sometimes see body odor coming along with that. There is actually a test that I do, um, which looks at phase one and phase two liver detoxification, um, which I won't bore you with the details on, um, but that can be very helpful with understanding there um, what can be done supported in that. Because within phase two, there's multiple pathways that we would use there um uh to um uh sort of support um the hormone clearance and toxin clearance as well there's over 200 different they're called xenobiotics which are essentially toxins our bodies process through all the time right now um and so thinking about the liver there again is something to think about if you want to discuss that further do feel free you can book an initial chat with me and we can maybe talk that through further um and then someone's asking about a a talk on helping girls balance their hormones as they start puberty. Um, I don't, but that is actually a good idea. I might do that. Um, I have a talk coming up. Um, I would need to check when it is. I think it's November, which is just on general hormone support, which um, uh, would be probably helpful for teenagers to come along to or any, any woman of any age. Um, but definitely, I think the younger you can start, the better. I wish I had known what I know now about my hormones when I was 
you know, 15 or 12. Um, I had no idea even what period was. 